So welcome everybody, Jeff Jackson, the Forge Fanatic here, and we are going to start today's great episode with my good friend Chris Leach down in Plainview, Texas. And our topic today is going to be pearl millets and everything cool about pearl millet. <laughs> because yeah. I have, between the two of us, not that I know a whole lot, but I have the man, the myth, the legend, the beard. Chris the beard. Leach with us today. <laughs> I don't even need a cool hat for a cool hat story. I just keep the beard. So, Chris, we're in the pearl millet business. There's lots of good stuff going on out there today. Yeah. And we have a couple of tremendous brachitic BMR yep. pearl millets. Yes, sir. So, between the two of us, let's, what, what's probably your favorite attribute or your number one favorite thing about the BMR pearl millets as you get to be in the industry, breeder, yeah, all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was talking to my neighbor actually this morning, and I think my favorite thing is at this point is just versatility, right? So right. what else can you do in the in the warm season, deep south, midwest, out west? Uh, everything besides the mountaintop, where can I get high protein? Where can I get an NDFD 30 over 55, 60, 65? Crazy. Regrowth, doesn't take much water. I mean, we're looking at a, a business plan with my neighbor who's one. He's a wheat pasture guy, right? So he's getting two sure. pounds of gain in the winter, but he gets one pound of gain in the summer on native pasture or some junky cheap hay grazer. But we think we're going to be able to to create like a 12 month year round program with him with winter, winter annuals and a summer annual mix with this, this BMR millet where we're getting three pounds in the summer. I mean, that, that changes your, your net margins on that thing amazingly. So for me, it's just a versatility, take it anywhere, put it anywhere and don't really have a problem. You know, insects don't bug it. So no that, pun intended. Yeah, yeah, no, no pun intended. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So your point about quality, I think that's a neat thing that I have helped promote and talked a lot about too. And I, I just pulled up some data next to me from a plot that we did here two years ago. Oh my gosh, four years ago. Planted June eighth, harvested July twenty second. So just barely over thirty, about forty, forty two days. Yep. Yep. 35 inches tall, crude protein, 15%, NDFD, 30 hours, 76. Whoa, dude, that is that is phenomenal. 76? Yes, 70, 76 on a 30-hour NDFD test. Uh-huh. TDN was 63.4. Uh, anyway, some of those numbers, RFQ 161. So anybody that understands fiber digestibility and quality, yeah. And it, I think about that time is probably I probably got this first set of results, and then I had to go wild and talk about uh, what did yeah. I ruminant rocket fuel? Yeah. I think yeah. is what I, I called it, right? Yeah, ruminant rocket fuel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. rocket fuel in the parlor. But seriously, when you talk about some of that, and guys are like, so a cow calf operation is one thing, but then you get into a dairy operation for again, you're looking for fast feed, high digestibility. Really good crude protein. Yep. Uh, oh, and by the way, at that level of digestibility, you slip it right in a lactating ration and probably not skip a beat anywhere. No, in fact, in fact, we're we're working with some local dairies to just really figure out as we lose water in the Ogallala, you know, all the dairies out west fighting this yep. stuff. We really think that we can do a double cut, triple cut, uh, pearl millet system. You're going to reel in the starch anyways at this point. You can't grow alfalfa. You can't grow corn. And you're down to, you know, it, and you can't reel in digestible fiber. I mean, not really, unless it's expensive. And so this is where I think the future is headed out west um, is really pushing for these high NDFD numbers. Ferment, it's, it's fermenting like a champ as long as you use a really good inoculant or, or wilt it just a tick. So... I, so, I think it's it's going to be a game changer in the next five years. We put a concerted effort into pearl millet because of what it is, how it's used, the versatility of it. And yeah. you've already made a couple of interesting comments that we could probably talk the next 40 minutes on. Yeah. And, and one thing was, and I'm just going to 
from a positioning standpoint. Your comment was almost anywhere but the top of a mountain. But let's talk about environmental conditions that are going to favor this pearl millet the best. And to your point, the higher we go, what happens to day length and temperatures, right? Yeah, so nighttime temps, if they're below 50 in the summer, you're going to see some dormancy start to hit that plant really quickly. Longer days are awesome as you go north, but let's make sure there's a few, there's a few key things, right? It's shallow planting warm soil, warm summer, and as soon as you cool off below 50, we're kind of done. And so just a few easy, easy points to keep in mind on that. You know, soil temp needs to be 60 for a really good fast stand, maybe if you're going to be warming in the next couple weeks. Just so you're all aware, I have put 65 degree soil temperatures on most of our technical information so that we know yeah. This is like following morning labels on anything else. Yeah. You can get a buy you can get by with some stuff, right? And and we all know how this goes, but I literally have told people 65 degrees is awesome. And if you're following another crop in the as you talked earlier about a 365 degree approach to this thing, if you're following another annual crop over winter, that's usually going to push you out far enough that you're going to hit pretty warm soil temps anyway. Right. So those days I don't worry so much about but the row crop guy that's used to planting corn and soybeans at colder temperatures, when they call and say, hey, where's that seed? I got the drill. I just got yeah. done with wheat. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little, I get little scary. Right. We get scared with that. So cooler temperatures and overnight temperatures are really, really will ding things. And right. yeah. I think when we get maybe a, a dip in some temperatures, uncharacteristic out of season, Yep. And it does that to the plant. And you notice that it looks like it's, when it gets a hangover, you almost have to give it an aspirin and reset. So sometimes yep. it feels yep. to me like if you go cut it after some of those events and kind of, it's like that plant remembers that it didn't feel good. And then when you clip it off, the tillers come back and away it goes. And it's like you hit the reset button almost. Is, am I wrong with that idea? That is the right idea in multiple situations. I've had it where guys overwater millet, even in a really warm climate like Arizona, yeah. let's say they get it too wet and they and they give it a hangover, like you say. <laughs> or you get you get those North Dakota funky, cool, cool evenings in the summer and you give it a hangover. Yes. Take that back. Make sure that on this BMR millet you're leaving a pretty good crowd amount, right? And if you're running a disc vine. Don't run it. Don't 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 tilt it right down into it. Right, you know you're running. The, if you're if you're opposed to, oh, back in the day the sickle stuff, right? Sickle sickle type mowers. It's a lot easier on the crop now that we're running higher speed disc binds of, of various brands and models. Doesn't matter. Right. And high rotor speed is is once you tilt that down into it, you're busting that crown open and you're killing the uh, uh, the new shoots coming out in the crown. So. If you're trying to get it out of a hangover, take it easy on it. It's already stressed. Don't don't fly through there at 13 miles an hour in your Heston, please. <laughs> um, you're trying to bring a sick kid back, right? But once you once you once you knock that off, you get some sunshine on it and a, and a light rain, or maybe you got some soil moisture. It's back to the races, baby. I mean, it's a, in a jiffy. So and I would I would tell, I would challenge people if you're curious on cutting heights. I've got a gentleman that follows us quite closely, and he would be in northeast Nebraska. He will go cut plants off, split the stem open, find where that growing point is, and then he will adjust his cutting height according to about 15 or 20 samples. And that, Man. That's, not common. that's not common, I would say, but if more people want to jump on that bandwagon and become A-plus students, that's how you do it. Yeah, yeah. he's like the brain surgeon of haymakers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the correct way to do it. I mean, and you're – what you're also going to do is you're going to add tonnage to that next cutting. And most guys don't want to spend the time. You're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't go look. So if we had to make a general statement, my guess is this. If we're 35 to 40 inches tall, we probably have to be cutting about six inches to leave that growing point in there. Yeah. Yeah. Six inches is, is usually a safe bet on, on anything. And to your point, if you want to screw around to find out, and clip it like you do your alfalfa because you're not yeah. nubbing the you're not nubbing the roots out. Yeah. You you what you think you're gonna leave in tons by cutting it six inches, 
that next cutting will be so sorely disappointing you'll wish you to left six inches and i think that's a very it does it goes back to my beard thing right i was out in the sun i shaved the beard off and i burned my face it's the same idea, especially in the southern climates with any type of summer annual. You clip that so tight, you also get a radiation from the soil where you've removed all that biomass. So in our area or Southern California, Chino Basin, Arizona, New Mexico, um, I had a guy that cut it like alfalfa his first year, right? First cutting. It was 121 degrees the next day. It had moist soil, but it just cooked it. So that soil temp is going to radiate back into that crown and just cook those new tender shoots. So be careful if you're in the south on that. Back to the beard. Cut height, wheel traffic, some of those things will be, if you're just trying to drive over every plant out there and see what happens, you're not going to have a good, I, I would say that's yeah. a, another catch-22 is that recreational driving without a reason out there. <laughs> not good. Yeah, you know, and I think guys need, and they, Guys will look at a product like this and then let's compare it to a conventional hybrid pearl melon or conventional sorghum sudan. The lack of lignin in that crown, because it's a better quality product, is prone to worse wheel traffic damage, right? There's no structure to help protect yeah. those new shoots in a, in a summer annual. And, um, yeah. you know, because you'll, you'll have a guy do a really great job, put up some really nice feed, but not plant it next year because his recreational driving was out of hand. And so uh, I think that's a terrible decision business-wise, but that's, that's the reason why it doesn't have as good a regrowth sometimes. And yeah, it's going to be clear. And you yeah. said it very clearly. Let's, let's make that statement. It's not the same as sorghum sedan grass, folks. If you're in a hay right. grade world, yeah, there's different management practices to follow. So regrowth is one thing. And you just made a comment about conventional pearl mill. So let's talk, just a little bit about conventional pearl millet versus uh, it's awesome for your typical beef cowboy kind of guy. And, and you don't have to micromanage that as much um, in terms of feeding it out. What's so, your thoughts? I mean, that's my personal opinion. I'm going to follow up on that because I got this neat little data sheet right next to me that talks about this cutting where I had conventional pearl millet and 4611 BMR side by side in 2020. And literally, I'm looking at these NDFD numbers from 2020, and it says that the BMR pearl millet was 76.2, and the conventional planted the same day, cut the same time was. So we'll go from 76 to 72. Barely. It was really good digestibility, but we're talking. 40 inches of plant height, 35 to 40 inches in 40 days. Right. We're cutting it in a nice vegetative stage. So there really wasn't a whole lot of difference because we hadn't laid it. The fiber hadn't gotten lignified yet at that point, basically, right. I'm guessing. But you're correct. Yeah, you're But correct. a cool example of how good they really are side by side. Crude protein was nearly the same. The conventional was a touch taller, and I think that I noticed that whenever I do side-by-side -side plots out here in a commercial setting, yep. it might just be a little bit quicker, or maybe it's not as brachitic. I'm not sure which it is, but, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. from a forage quality standpoint, you. so one of the digestibility parameters was four points difference, and when we get to RFQ, it was like 15 points less. Yeah. But when you start throwing in the, the fiber and the digestibility, because it had a little more fiber, a little bit less digestible. Yeah. Six tenths, seven tenths of a point more lignin, so 3.2 to 3.9. Anyway, for anybody that cares about nutritional numbers, yeah. It's really still pretty good stuff. Well, and let, let's compare 4507 to a lot of the other products that are still out there. You know, there's a lot of conventional hybrid pearl millets. Still then there's that. Around. Right, and they, they're they're as old as me, which doesn't say much, but um, Tiff Lee, by the way, people, yeah, yes, Tiff Three, other <laughs> products, you know, and they were awesome in their time, but yes, the the lignin's mm -hmm. higher, uh, they've got more leaf disease pressure, um, prone problems in you know higher humidity environments. Yeah, but let's face it, a lot of times forty five oh seven is going to go to like I saw some nice stuff in the Sand Hills. 
of Nebraska, and they're going to just let it grow until the season's done. And so it, it, for most of the guys, I'm seeing it on. And, and so they're going to be, you know, not in that 70 range, but it's still going to be a lot better on the NFD. But it's still going to be a lot better than tip three. And so I think that's, you know, 4507 is probably the most digestible conventional pro millet uh, in the country right now. Well, and I think the other neat important thing that you mentioned is that there are a lot of pearl millets that go into some pretty, uh, pretty humid areas, a lot of humidity, a lot of leaf diseases. Yep. And I've seen some of these side by side. And uh, it's, it's an amazing difference when you look at the leaf health, the plant health. And then yeah. I did a comparison on my farm here a couple of years ago, too, where I had golden German millet next to 4507 conventional pearl millet. Yeah. And I had about a season with, you know, 35 or 40 inches of rain, which produces some pretty good yield. But just the leaf disease pressure that even the golden German millet had versus that 40, it was like yeah. night, night and day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. Just like a ragged, beat up, old, rusty, disease stricken thing. And this didn't have a speck of anything on it side by side. It shouldn't. You know, we, on, on an annual basis, we'll look at 400 new crosses a year. And picking out that leaf disease pressure is, has become very important for us. So I wanted to go a little bit more agronomic on this thing. You talked about planting shallow, shallower or shallow earlier. So yeah, I think we've talked about maybe shoot for three quarters of an inch, roughly. Yeah, half to three quarters of an inch and uh, warm soil. And let's talk about the soils you don't need to plant millet in, right? So I will get some some calls before we even talk about how to plant. Let's see if we can plant. You know, deep <laughs> deep, <laughs> deep black clays, river bottoms, right, right in heavy soil. Anything that's going to get waterlogged and stay waterlogged, just stay away from. You know, millet can't handle those wet feet all summer. If you look at where millet came from, right, it came from sub-Saharan Africa. It came from India. We're not looking at planting this in the Amazon basin, right? We're looking out west where the rest of us live. And so the deep south, once you get into like Lake Charles Clay, Louisiana, parts of Texas, just get your favorite BMR sorghum suit in and don't even try the millet. Let's, let's, let's make sure that doesn't happen. But any kind of soil where sorghum sudans can't fit, you better put your millet. Salty soil, saline seeps, um, uh, caliche, white soil, sand, chalky soil, anything that's got a pH issue, uh, iron chlorosis issue, doesn't matter with the millet, right? Plant it in a road bed, it'll grow in a caliche road. So uh, it's going to make the most tonnage quicker than any kind of sorghum can in precarious situations. Yes, but going back to planting depth now, three anything past three quarters, you may only get 50%, 30% up out of that deal. And so spending some time with either the guy that's planting for you or if you're planting, get your fingernails dirty and spend a good amount of time out there. Down pressure uh, on no-till guys, if you've got part of your field that's pretty soft and you've got your down pressure turned up, you're not going to get a stand, right? We're going to sink it to China. Yeah. And so that, that's very important to pay attention to field by field. Don't be like me. Don't set your planter on one field and 1,200 acres later, hope it's still set right. You know, um, you really need to get out at every place. That's a pretty good message. And, and with myself being in the alfalfa business, talking about small seeded crops, getting – seed beds right and consistent planting depth and soil type changes and tillage type changes from farm to farm to grower to grower yeah and i i would agree 100 percent, man that uh now i'm also gonna say and i know you and i both frequent this website or this facebook page called hay kings or silage kings or the hay yeah. Yeah. whichever of the three right we spend a lot of time there right we're still gonna get somebody I'm going to preface this by saying there are more advantageous ways to plant crops. And then there are ways that you sometimes use what you've got. That's right. Yeah. So when we get the comments about, well, I disked up my field and I put it in a fertilizer cart and I spread it and I harrowed it in and it worked just fine. Yeah. 
my comments to those are that's probably not the best, most um, thought sought after management practice. Yeah. Can it work? Yes. Yes. Will it work the best? Probably not. And you will it work just, every year? No. One of these years is not. You might just get what you asked for by trying to cut corners. And I, I pre, I ask, I beg people, please at least try to find a drill if you can. Yeah. Get it in the ground a half, three quarters of an inch deep. That would be my favorite because laying on top and then some loose soil that's just simply been harrowed. Now you've got to pray for rain or irrigate, and we don't have that luxury. So I, I just wanted to throw that in there because that's going to be the next comment. Well, we just used an Endigate cedar, and it was fine. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, unless you're the neighbor that everybody hates, it's worth paying your neighbor to come use the correct equipment for yeah. 18 16 18 $20 an acre to get it done right, you know? Um, it, it is so well worth it. My neighbor plans a lot of my stuff when I don't have time and it makes a huge difference. No, absolutely. I'm just going to toss this out here. So I had 2020 data from one location and 2021 data from another location, uh, same location, different year. But just for reference, folks, we're talking about a 40. Okay. So 40 inches of BMR pearl millet planted at 15 pounds of the acre on really good dirt taken care of was 3.7 tons of dry matter in 44 days. That's phenomenal. That's a pretty dang good crop. So keep in mind. Yeah. And this, I'll give you the date. This, the location was uh, West Salem, Wisconsin. So. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're, we're talking, we're a little farther North. So we're talking interstate 90. Yeah. Right on the Mississippi river in a pretty good location. So good dirt, good moisture. Again, 3.7 tons. And believe it or not, the sorghum sedan grass planted right next to it, 3.5 tons. So literally wow. equaled the tonnage of the sorghum sedan grass planted in the same field at the same time. That's what Was that a May plant date? When would that have been? June. Generally, June. they are going to plant, as we would say, 65 degree soil temperature, June 1st, June 6th, somewhere in that first week if they can hit it. Okay. Man, that's great to know. I think that something else is important to look at. If you look at NOAA's long range yeah. forecast for this summer, this is a millet year out west. You're looking at possibly more drought conditions or less than acceptable rainfall. And if you look at the amount of feed produced in a less than adequate rainfall amount, generally these millets are going to outperform anything else out there in the summer. I would like to talk about what you think. I'm going to give an example about what I think and what I saw. I've been on this bandwagon to help get more pearl millet in the country because I think of the U potential versus some of the other style of millets, golden German, Siberian, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the white, the white wonders. Wait a minute. Is that a, yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a millet, yeah. Um, the pro-so millets, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so again, on my farm, so sometimes that's kind of neat, I split a drill. 4507 conventional pearl millet with golden German millet. I talked about the plant health here just a minute ago. At 45 days, I went and harvested 10 foot a row, mm -hmm. two rows wide. So I had uh, seven and a half inch spacings on a drill, calculated the, the area, worked it all backwards. I had four ton of dry matter, which would be very similar to what I just talked about here. Four ton of dry matter on my 4507 pearl millet and two ton of dry matter on my golden German millet planted the same rate, same side by side, same drill, same day. Sure. I don't know if my rate was too low, but my observation on those plant types is that I had 10x the leaf material. Yep. And I had excellent regrowth on the pearl millet and the golden German millet was kind of, it had a head on it already, kind of done in 45, 50 days. Yep. Nothing. So as you go west and start talking about people in the western states, maybe even bring that rim back around down south towards yourself, what do you see observations, testimonial stories with guys doing regular millets versus a good hybrid pearl millet and those kind of scenarios too, from yield-wise and stress tolerance-wise? Well, let's back up to the differences. I mean, you're, it says it all in the name, right? You're a hybrid. So these are a three-way cross. We're crossing a male and a female. 
to make our female and crossing it with another male. This is no difference in, do you want a set of Herefords? Do you want a set of all black cows? Do you want some black white face things you can take to the cell barn? So you're getting some hybrid vigor here and that's what's gonna carry you through droughts better. We're gonna have larger root mass through this selective breeding process. By far. By far, I mean, you're looking at eight foot of fibrous roots on most of these varieties, whereas your quicker single strain things, you know, 45 days until they're done, you're never gonna get there with the roots, right? You're not gonna pick up your deep fertilizer that your crops missed. That'll, that, and that's why we're still getting some really good feedback from guys in the West and the Midwest where uh, excessive fertilizer over the years and corn and beans and a few other things, your millet's gonna go pick and scavenge all that expensive stuff you put out there and, and run it back through your animals or your hay or, or however you're selling your millet. Uh, the tonnage typically is double on most of these, if not better. I mean, you've got some stories on that too, like your house and stress tolerance. If you look at the stress tolerance as something that was only meant to live 40 days versus something that can live all summer, it's, it's a huge difference there. I mean, and mainly that's the, the roots, the root system there. You're never going to find wide leaves in a millet unless you go through a selective breeding process and wide leaves mean digestibility. And, and that's, it's, it's, it's a no brainer really. Once you start looking at it, I don't have anybody that I know of, that went back to German, Japanese, white wonder. I mean, and the guys using pro cell for hay, I'm really confused about because that's kind of like the bird seed thing. Um, it's cheap, but it's not, you're, you're not really gaining much there. Um, you know, out west, you it's a make or break thing every summer. And so why would you be using something that's generally not going to ton even close? So... I, I tell you what, after I'd done those first couple of comparisons, spent some time around you guys, looked at more plots, done more. I mean, so we've been pretty heavy on this thing for six years. Yeah. And my, that's been my goal is to take every time I hear about somebody buying 10 truckloads of foxtail millet, I'm like, man, we got to have, we got to have oh. 10 the hybrid pearl millet out there, at least one so they know the difference and get to see it. But yeah. So to your point, scavenging nutrients. And we get into some of those dairy situations, the bigger root system we have, the more nutrients yeah. we can take, the more hay we can take off, the more nutrients we can, which sounds weird to the, the, the row crop guy in the yeah. West. Yeah. But when you're in a dairy situation or you've got a, a confinement next to you or whatever large animal operation it might be, maybe it's even a small one, the more P and K you can get taken out of that and nitrogen that you can scavenge and not have leach through the system or screw up your DNR manure management plan, it's going to be a good thing. And your point about the roots. So there's this really weird buzzword going on in the industry today, and it's like carbon. Yeah. So if you have a deep root, a very fibrous, deep rooted plant, that's just another sink. Yeah. Deeper. The yeah. more you can protect that carbon that you're trying to store as well. So, so interesting enough, on a carbon sequestration standpoint, hybrid millets put more carbon into the ground than any other summer annual grass. And so if you're trying to capitalize on one of those programs, this is where you need to be, um, in, in my personal opinion. So fantastic. It's also good on, I mean, I feel like I'm like jackrabbit trailing you through here, but it's also really good on nematode activities, right? Um, I've got some guys that have called up here from cotton countries uh, asking about using BMR or non-BMR millets to help with their nematodes, um, using that as a cover crop. And the breakdown of um, some of the portions of the millet are working against the nematodes. So that's, you know, a little biofumigation activity as well. Uh, some of the potato guys are doing that as well. So it, the thing's super versatile. Oh, and by the way, since we're on the insect topic, it's not sugarcane aphid host either. So it's yeah. a temperate crop for sugarcane aphids. Yeah. Think about that, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you don't want to keep spraying for aphids, I mean, just plant millet. I mean, it's just like way too simple to get away from, you know, especially some of these cowboy guys that I'll ask them, hey, did you have uh, – do you have any sugarcane aphids in your hay grazer last year? And I knew what they planted and it's not aphid tolerant. Oh no, I never have aphid. And you go look at their hay and it's black with soot, and, you know, and, 
You know, I just, it's easy. It's a, it's a good fit for people that aren't going to be hardcore managers. Don't it really works it. well. I, I would agree. And so no sugar cane aphid host. So you don't have to worry about that. It helps break up some of these guys that might be farther north in row crop country. If you can do your crop rotation piece, it's not a corn rootworm host. It's not going to host gosses, wilt, tar spot, all those other things that are just ripping people apart right now. So again, in your rotation, and if you were to rotate your pearl millet with an awesome triticale crop, and go 365 days a year, that time schedule when one gets planted and the last one goes off and when you can swap out, put some manure in there and get going. Yep, yep. Phenomenal. It's about, a, yeah. it's about as sweet a spot as you can get. So, yeah, it is. Uh, planting rate. I, I So, again, I threw out 15 pounds of the acre. That's going to be a pretty good soil. Do you see any people uh, really exceeding 15 pounds of these good pearl millets or getting less? Where are those acres? Where do we divide that gap on planting rates? It's about as the planting rate opinions are about as diverse as the amount of people in America, right? Boom! It, it fits everywhere and everything. And so I have... <laughs> Let's say if you go, I had a guy call from Midland, Odessa yesterday, right? I didn't know anything grew there but oil wells. And he's, <laughs> he's uh, seriously, I thought he was joking. He's growing this dry land at one pound per acre Woo. in an area that you really can't farm well, right? So you can either set your air seeder for that or buy a canola plate. You know, if you don't have a good box drill or you don't have a, a good air seeder, buy a canola plate for your planter. Right, that is very important. You want to you want to get a good stand on low pop. Use your bean planter on 15s or 20s or whatever. You set that in there, and it, it is like clockwork. So canola and millet seed, they're both sixty thousand seed a pound ish, depending on what you get. Um, easy way to get it set on on that deal. Now you can go. I've got some guys in the far northeast where it's it's just a little wetter and, and they may plant 20 pounds to the acre but they they're going to have their wheel traffic is worse because it's wetter soil they're trying to make up for crowns there so i think 15 10 15 is a good number yeah i could see that being a deal too like you just said and we see some of that in the in the other business i work in with small seeds you plant a few more pounds you get more plants to begin with you get a little extra weird wheel traffic lots of wheel traffic Make a higher probability of a few more are going to make it. So that makes good sense. Now, here's an argument that we always see in the sorghum sedan grass world, but I'm going to bring it back to what we're just talking about is planting population. And the guy goes, Well, if you normally plant 15, uh, I'm going to plant 30 pounds because I got to have a fine stem so it's palatable and it'll dry down. <laughs> Pearl millet, no way, Jose. Uh -uh. Not at all. Not at all. Such a high leaf to stem ratio to begin with and it tillers so crazy after you cut it yeah. anybody that says that they have a pearl millet issue with palatability and digestibility dry down type things the dry down is because it yields so damn much yeah that the windrow is just going to be tough to dry but from a palatability standpoint don't plant more for palatability no. No. because you will not need it the only times I've ever recommended higher seed rates is, is two reasons. Way up north, when you when we cross into Canada and these guys are trying it in southern Ontario, yep. your window's so tiny for warm days. And and when you drop the pop on a summer annual and you allow it to tiller, you're also increasing the maturity date on it. And so you sure. can if this guy in Midland that's gonna do a pound, it's gonna take twenty days longer to get to where you really need to be if you're planting the correct rate. I don't recommend a pound. That's, I don't even know how the dude's farming down there, right? I mean, it's, it's, maybe he's just got oil money. I don't know. But, but really, you need that, that, that 10 pound rate plus on that deal. Um, it almost, almost makes you wonder if he's hoping that it's going to be a cover crop to keep the sand from blowing or the, the, the soil from blowing. And then if there's enough, he'll graze it or take a crop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of his thoughts. Um, what if? Well, yeah, what if? But yes, that 10, 15 pounds is, is a great little average to run with. Um, like we said earlier, you're going to lose some in your stand to not get it perfectly set in there. The other, there's another big thing before we ever run out of time. You really got to get your sprayer 
to put on your chemistry right behind the planter, drill, you know, air seed or whatever. This stuff comes up extremely fast, right? So growing seed crops yeah. here, it, it spiked in 24 hours, planted at a half inch deep in warm soil it's at 70 degrees. So if it spiked and you run out there with your paraquat, you know what's going to happen, right? It's done. It's toast. And so, so it's very important that the dude spraying for you or the custom guy understands that he's got to follow you through nearly immediately because this stuff grows so, so fast. And we've run into more problems lately from guys just thinking it's corner beans and I'll get there in a few days, you know, no, park your drill, get in your sprayer, finish it, go to the next field. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're planting a crop that's fast. So, very important. So you just touched on something that I will get 500 phone calls on, so let's cut it down to six. Um, okay. Crop protection. Yep. Chemistry types that are labeled for, for, for pearl millet. Right, right. And there, there are some labeled products out there, but you also got to be careful. These are low lignin millets. Those labels were made when pearl millets were a, a, like a TIF-3, a little more stout and stand-up-ish. And so it's important to also talk about one thing before we even get any further in the chemistry. If you have a summer annual grass problem, don't plant millet. It will choke it out. You have zero opportunity grass. to yeah. stop grass from coming up in it and, it, and and it just can't handle that competition. So if you know you got a clean field free of most summer annual grasses, rock on with it. Let's get it, let's get it planted right behind the, the drill. Generally, it's, it's an easy pass of, of Paraquat, a light rate of atrazine, and maybe two ounces of Callisto, and that's about it. Um, and then once you get your, your millet up and growing, uh, I'm going to say the D word, apparently the D word's bad this year, but dicamba right over the top. Um, let it have five true leaves. That's what's really important. A light rate of dicamba and a light rate of atrazine. Do not put oil in it. Do not put whatever hocus pocus they're trying to sell you to put as an edge of it. Don't put it in there. It will burn the millet. It's, it's like, it's terrible. So very simple. Water, buffer, maybe, yeah. maybe buffer for hard water. Uh, no, not even, don't even buffer it. No buffer because, because dicamba, the dicamba is more hormone action, right? Okay. And so dicamba and atrazine, you can throw a couple tenths of an ounce of peak in there if you want it in the summer. But uh, uh, that's the other beauty about millet. The chemistry program is extremely cheap and extremely yeah. effective. And right. so after five leaves, and if you had a good stand and you spray your dicamba, it should, it should cover up. You're done. It should be clean as a whistle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, behind the planter, if you got some hard to kill weeds, you don't like, you know, paraquat drifts sometimes. So maybe you want to toss in a little sharpen instead of paraquat. Um, that that's an opportunity as well, but yeah, please reach out to me if on chemistry questions, don't go blowing a pint or a quart or something ridiculous, a 2,4-D, and then ask me why it took a nap and laid over. I mean, this stuff is uh, kind of susceptible to certain hormones. On and, and then, you know, it's like you said, the dudes that go out there and plant it with a disc and a, and a spreader are the guys that might put out a quart of 2,4-D. It might work for the year, but one of these years, it, you'll, you'll, you're not going to be impressed with that program. So, yeah. And, and since you said the word 2,4-D, and we always have guys in different parts of the country saying, hey, I'm, I, I just did a burn down with a quart of gly or uh, 16 mm. ounces of glyphosate and a pint or a quart of 2,4-D, and I want to go plant right into it. That's a no-no. Um, yeah, typically, I mean, everyone's different in the U.S., typically running a hormone right ahead of the planter with that very shallow planted grass. Not a good idea. You're going to muck up the roots and shoots on that guy. So um, it's it's always better to run something with no soil activity as as a pre plant burn down. Most and people, time. some people don't realize that there is that much activity from a two four D, especially the ester illumination, that it does hang around on the soil for a little while. So just be aware of that. Especially if you plant it, got a driving rainstorm, pushed it down into the sea. Right in. Oh man, yeah we'll be having a phone call on that one. So it's a bad day. 
fertility on pearl millet. Sure. If, they, if they've been doing some sorghum sedan grass business, how much different or what's that look like for a pearl millet fertility program? For most guys, and, and it's important to bring up your study that you did with the uh, nitrogen versus nitrates and sulfur, I try to tell guys don't go out less than 40 units in on your first cutting and a good dose of sulfur. Unless you've got your sulfur kind of brought up in your ground, you know, because you got nitrogen and sulfur coming up through the plant to put together to make the protein you so desperately want out of this. Those are going to tie up together when you don't have the sulfur, you got all the nitrogen, you're not going to have that protein level you're looking for and could possibly have a nitrate issue. So the, the, the N word, <laughs> the N word. I don't like talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So most definitely no nice. less than 40 uh, high rainfall with sand, maybe 60, 65 pounds of yeah. N. Um, it's not much different than the sorghum side. Uh, I have personally in my neck of the woods like to put out a pound of zinc with it helps with yeah. a little bit of drought tolerance. Uh, well worth it. Um, and most guys have a P and K um, level that's acceptable for millet, right? So if yeah. you're on a manure situation, you got plenty, it's going to pick it up. If you're out West, generally your soil is naturally going to have enough unless you're in a little bit of a, a true sugar sand scenario. So it's a, it's a pretty cheap crop to fertilize. It's not too bad at all. Absolutely. So that being said, that, that brings up, everybody will always ask, well, it's a pearl millet. Can it get nitrates too? Yes, guys, you can have a nitrate issue with pearl millet. So again, yeah. balance that accordingly. And as Chris said, about 40, 45 pounds for that first cut. And don't think, well, you know what? I don't want to spread it twice. I'm going to put 80 or 90 out here up front because we'll luxury consume nitrogen. Yep. We're going to cut it on a short cutting period, 45 days. It hasn't had time enough to utilize all that nitrate in the plant. And you will call back and go, oh, no. It's hot. Yeah. How do I dilute this enough to feed it, basically? Yeah, 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 exactly. And that and it, it happens to guys every year, right? Just take your time in take your time, spread it twice, chemigate it twice, whatever you're doing, uh, you'll, you'll be much happier with the results. You know, when you, and the other thing is you're saying, if you do it all up front, you don't have a nitrate issue, your second cutting is going to falter anyways, uh, cause you didn't have enough nitrogen. Um, and if you're feeding it yourself through your own grow yard, cows, whatever, you know, dairy, you're going to have a pile of really good protein digestibility and a pile of, you know, quasi protein. And so, you know, if you want to be able to feed that same stuff year round, quality feed, split your fertilizer up. Multiple groups I've talked to, different things I've tried. We've seen some people that are using sort of sedan grasses very creatively in maybe some grass pasture situations and other things. And, and I just wanted to bring this up because I think you're going to have about the same feeling. If the dirt you're planting into doesn't have a dead crop on it, don't plant pearl millet because it can't handle that extra competition. So right. for somebody that sees this guy that's planted, well, for example, we've taken a first cutting alfalfa. Yep. Literally planted sorghum sedan grass into a live alfalfa stand and had it do pretty well. Yep. I don't think that pearl millet has the, maybe it's the seed size and the vigor to compete with that and get going. A lot of it's the seeding depth, right? So that alfalfa is going to suck that top point. Oh portion out and dry and so once it comes up you're done and so yeah. that that's been the biggest concern with guys doing things like that yeah so i just want to caution everybody because you're going to ask that question well i saw somebody or heard this or jeff <laughs> you were on a meeting talking about one thing or another and was that yeah. pearl bullet? no that was a sorghum sedan grass yeah. Pearl bullet. yeah i have had guys go like to your point we uh first cutting alfalfa let it get a few inches tall nuked it mm -hmm. Maybe put a slurry out, some some pit water, done a little fertilizer application, 16,000 gallons of manure, adds a little moisture, and then they go plant the pearl millet in, no-till right over it. Beautiful crop. No, no big deal. Yeah. No, but no, big deal. no competition. <laughs> That's a kicker. No competition. Chinch bugs. Ooh. Chinch bugs on pearl millet, folks. You still need to scout this crop for chinch bugs. It will knock your teeth in if you're not paying attention, I think. Uh, it, it can. So the guys with high cover, 
the guys I really see fault with it is where we have maybe a wheat where we used a, a, a header high cut and you got all these exactly tracks, right. right. And you come back in. Uh, if you think you're going to have that problem, see if your local dealer rep co-op person, seed guy can put some treatment on it. You can run a little imidacloprid on it. You should be okay. So if you think you're going to have a problem with chinch bugs in that situation, spend a dollar an acre and get that treated. Right on. It's well worth it. So seed treatment standpoint, you just talked about having a little bit of insect protection, but folks, um, just to clarify, we do not do safened, concept treated, or like active right. ingredient. Pearl millet does not handle that well. And yeah. I asked uh, about that a dozen times and goes, no, I've seen this movie enough times. We're not going to even talk about it, please. Yeah. And that's funny as the sequel is the same. Like there's not, it's always, it's always a disaster. So um, just so you know, Concept, Soar Pro, any products like that, that's safe in sorghum seed, millet is not sorghum. It's not, cre Concept was not created to safe in millet, right? And so it's, 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 it's apples and oranges at this point. If I do, and we've tried it, if we try to do our seed production with safener on it, we end up with a 15% germ in 24 hours. So you just literally don't have anything left. And then once you apply your dual Matula Chlor type product, you take out the rest of it. So I know it sounds like an awesome idea. I wouldn't even toy with it at all. So. Well, I've asked that question enough times. I'm surprised that you even are engaging in the conversation, but <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just know, folks, that, yeah, we don't have that option for the residual herbicide on the pearl millet side. So, yeah, some of those in-season pieces, like you talked about earlier, with a little bit of Callisto, some some well, that, you know, out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really good program. Anything like new, different, creative? I mean, it's worth asking. Like, is there anything really that you're sitting back there going, hmm, that you can let out of the bag? I mean, there's yeah, some yeah, yeah. I yeah. I, I think what's really cool in the near future, <laughs> we've spent a few years trying to get through different crosses of a faster. BMR and or non-BMR silage specific millet for the north. We're trying to get something that's mm. extremely fast growth, same tonnage or better than the others that you can maybe shave 15, 20 days off up there. And, and still we're, we're trying to work into that northern beef and dairy market, right? And so I think that's our next goal. And uh, when you come down to the nursery this summer, I think you, you'll be impressed with some of them. So we talked a little bit about guys harvesting with the disc bind, hydro swing, sycamore, whatever it is. And we talked about cutting height. Yeah. And we talked about how versatile it is. We also will get the question, well, obviously we can cut it multiple times. We can still graze this stuff with great, great efficacy, guys, and not worry about it. But don't let them graze it down to the dirt. Right. Manage your grazing height so you don't get down into your growing points and cause some issues. And again, you're probably going to have to wait till it's about, what, 18 inches, 20 inches tall, so you're not jerking it out of the ground when they try to graze. Yes, I had a phone call three years ago from a family friend that was disturbed by his millet problem. I didn't know what he was talking about. So drove 30 minutes out to the guy's irrigated pastures and the cows had had the crowns in their mouth with the roots sticking out, right? And uh, it wasn't so much in early grazing, but he grazed it into the ground and that's all that was left, right? We're just sure. going to it into the dirt. So um, you want to make sure you have enough. There's two reasons for getting the roots down there, right? When you bite that off of that millet, it needs enough um, root mass to, number one, hold it in the ground, and number two, bring up enough nutrients quick enough to repair itself. And so I see a lot of guys going in there in that 16, 12 inch, you know, it looks like a, a yard, like a wheat pasture or something, and it just doesn't have the root mass to get you that fast that fast regrowth. And so right. you would just wait another 10 days, 15 days you'd be amazed at the regrowth. And so, yeah, yeah, very important there. I so perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, I always say knee high is probably a good way to, to get in on it. Um, depends on how tall you are, though. I found that out the hard way. Um, 
So <laughs> all, all the Dutch guys on us out here, knee high is, you know, pretty decent, decent size millet. But, um, but yeah, you know, you know, 30 inches max before you want to turn in, um, you get past that and we start heading into 30 to 45 inches. You start heading into boot and things slow down. So hit that window 24 to 35, 40 inches before you start throwing a boot. Perfect. So now we're just talking about grazing. One of the last big things that's uh, a big conversation of contention every year is prussic acid. So grazing, pearl millets, and prussic acid. Yeah. Guys, beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Graze it right through the frost, right? No problems. Mm -hmm. um, millets, uh, any, any of the millets that you have, and millets in general don't create prussic acid, to a volume to to create health issues in your in your ruminants so that's a great thing for out here a lot of our guys are going to bale it once water it and then yep. let it frost kill and then use that as their winter winter pasture and it's it's phenomenal i even have a gentleman uh actually the guy i talked about that will go pull the plants apart and, and measure where the 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 growing point is before he cuts, he has a per couple particular fields that he will put weed on, mm -hmm. take weed off in July, plant his pearl millet in August, and just for one thing as cover, yep. keeping a live root in the soil for a while, and he'll let that, like you just said, it'll freeze off, and then he'll run cows out there. I think he has a cornfield adjacent to it, so they'll get corn stalks and pearl millet to graze. And oh, man, that's it, perfect. It leaves some really nice cover out there. It leaves a good root mass with, the, as we talked about, this fibrous root system to hold things in place. And what yep. they stomp down the, as we talk about, again, we could really go crazy with this, but soil microbiology and they step on a few leaves. Don't be so worried if they put a few leaves on the ground, they're feeding the bugs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got, you got to feed the whole community, right? Yes, that's right. That's important. Very important. Man, your brain surgeon's got a cool operation up there, sounds like. He does, yeah. He, he does a good job. I would say, you know, and now, now that I've got a few more family members in that program doing the, the fall grazing, the amount of time that they're not hauling hay in the snow, oh, man, can't beat it. And uh, that it, that's one where I kind of like the uh, trying to get the 4507. And, and letting it grow up pretty good because it'll stand good through the winter, but try to plant it before that seed head pops. I mean, you, I'm, what I'm trying to say, I want that yes. seed head to frost out. I don't want to make a seed. So like you said, August, you give it 45 days, and then the nights cool off. It's phenomenal, man. Done. Right. Oh, so that might be any of those guys. Uh, interestingly enough, I'll get some people that'll plant like vegetable crops or sweet corn or something like that. They take it out a little bit early. Yeah. And you're like, is there anything we can make feed with on this acre yet in your August? And you're yeah. like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some yeah. of this stuff in. and Yeah, yeah. so really good. Um, what else? Is there anything that we haven't covered today? We've got a lot of ground oh, under yeah. our feet. No, but there is a good thought on this whole August, early August planting is um, – Millets are heat unit driven in growth. And so as long mm -hmm. as you have that, that moisture reservoir below it, it's going to produce more tonnage in a short amount of time than any other sorghums, anything else out there that you can throw at it. And so I, it, once it gets into August, I just tell guys, you've got to plant the millet, you know, it'll be fast out of the ground, fast to tonnage, fast to feed. So I'm going to throw this out there, Chris, uh, because I know the answer and we just talked about it a lot for an hour and 10 minutes. The state of the warm season annual business right now, there's probably going to be a nice shortage. Yeah. We're going to run out of sorghum sedan grasses folks. And if you haven't done some of these pearl millets for everything that we just talked about for the last, depending on which video you get to watch for the last hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, that can be a really nice alternative for you if you've traditionally planted sorghum sedan grass. Yeah. Again, to your point, they're not related, but yeah. there's a lot of similarities in their growth yeah. with heat units and uh, water use efficiency. Yeah, yeah, that that is that's very true and, and just right. I mean, there's just you're right. There's no 
There is no overage of seed from any seed production company in the U.S. this year at all. Uh, between hail storms, wind storms, frost, you know, early frost, late frost, we've just, it's just been the perfect storm and it's been a tough year. So if you don't have your order in soon, you may be buying hay from your neighbors this year. And so uh, millet's a good fit for all those tough, tough spots. And uh, most guys that do some millet quit using other products. So, so the other little tidbit, we talked a little bit about growing habits and you made a comment about if it's going to be really wet and stinky, pearl millet doesn't like wet feet. No. You also, and I'm, I'm going to bring this back around because I had this happen on another crop. You get something that you mentioned nasty soil tolerant from saline, sodic, salts, iron chlorosis, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are a couple of those soil conditions that happen to be around a slough or a pothole or a wet spot that the water table will come and go a little bit. So some of those potholes in North Dakota and other places probably. Yeah. yeah if you yeah. go plant, if it's dry and you go plant this stuff in there and then you get a good rain and those potholes kind of fill up and saturate the soil, you're probably not going to gain many acres in some of those scenarios because, again, that soil is going to be saturated around that root system. Yeah. yeah. So I want to throw that caution out there because that's the next thing I'm going to get. Well, you said it was good on salt, and I planted it right through that yeah. <laughs> spot. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of that goes out to a lot of guys out west using uh, mountain water where you get some salty conditions and some spots. Correct. And it, here's something interesting to note. If you're using or you're – you know, irrigation water with high saline content or your soils have a high salt content and you have a choice in, and it doesn't matter if it's millet or sorghums or sorghum sudan grass or sudans, you have to use a BMR, right? Don't choose the conventional midrib. It ties the salt up into that plant structure and that's what causes those droughty issues. When you have that brown midrib, you don't have as much lignin the salt is not actually tied into the plant structure then it's kind of a free agent and it really doesn't it doesn't affect the plant growth if you want to see it for yourself get a bag of bmr get a bag of non-bmr plant it on a salty patch you'll be blown away at the difference on a hot day that's where that comes from actually chris i tell you what this little interview has been a long time coming and it feels so good to have all this information captured finally because uh yeah <laughs> you i have this weird production experience on one side of the bag and you have this neat production experience on the other side. And now again, like you said, you get to play around with all the family members and do all the other stuff. So right. it's a neat little collection of observations, experiences. The biggest thing for people to remember is if somebody says, no, you can't plant pearl millet, you're too far north. I think elevation probably has more of an attribute to that than latitude. I think it's Elevation yeah. and nighttime temperatures will be your limiting factor yep. versus just being north because you can yeah. get north in some plain states and it is hot and dry and hot all night long and yeah. other areas seem to cool off more. So just be careful. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, it, it's soil temp based for the most part to start with and then it's nighttime temp based to finish up. And right on. Gosh, you can get you can be as far south as me and just be over here in the mountains by my house and you can't grow it. So, I mean, <laughs> might as well call That's me right. far north, right? So That's exactly guys, right. You're right. I mean, everybody's in in a different situation, so don't disqualify <clears throat> just because of an interstate zone. My two cents. Graze it, cut it for hay, cut it, wilt it, do baleage, cut it, wilt it, do silage. Moisture content that it keeps best in a silage situation. Experience there tells you. So I would have four years ago told you if you don't wilt it, wilt it we're going to have butyric party all day long when you open up your pit, right? Right? Wet, wet stuff's terrible. That's what we know. That's what we know. Now we know something new, right? Um, when, you, when you look at something with a leaf mass that grows close to the ground like millet, and you wilt it, and you're in a Western environment, what happens to your ash content? 
it goes way up. And so you're introducing stuff into your pile you may not really want to introduce. Besides just the mineral and the, the, the ash itself, you're introducing other bacteria, fungi mm. and stuff into your room and you don't want. Until we started using higher CFU count inoculants that are, that are used in wet grasses and in Europe. And once, we, and once we inoculate this correctly, we can direct chop some of these millets um, not that you want to haul water, I mean, a long distance with silage, but if, yes. if, you know, we were putting it up somewhere in that 77, 78 and, and opening it and it's beautiful, no butyric problems. Um, you know, tip, if you're not going to use a really good inoculant and if you're not going to pay attention to how well you're running your inoculator on your chopper, um, go ahead and wilt it, get it down like you would corn silage. If you're, but if you're wanting to just, you know, take take that extra pass out of wheel traffic, that extra cost of running your your slother. Yeah, get a good inoculant and make sure it's the correct one. Right on. That that's really good advice. And have you seen guys when they're doing their pearl millet uh, direct cut that way? Will they increase the chop length just a little bit so they're not making too small a piece and getting a bigger piece of fiber in there, or does that make much difference? It, it's, I don't see too many guys making some real long stuff per se. I'm talking inch and a half maybe. Oh yeah. M most of our guys are inch to inch and a half when you're direct chopping. Right. All day long. Man, it sure packs good. Um, yeah. Um, do you get, do you see much seepage out of a pearl millet pile with cutting, let's say 75% with a long, long fiber inch and a half? Only when you have a, a, a less than adequate fermentation, right? If you if you don't ferment in those few hours, you know, for a few days right afterwards, you're going to have seepage when you when you're fermenting correctly. I, I don't see that big a problem anymore. That's perfect. And I think there's been um, well, I just came off of doing the Central Plains Dairy Expo, and I'll bet you I've ran into five people that talked to somebody about some really good grass inoculants that help at higher moistures. And I think that's a message that we need to let people know that there are some out there today that, yep. that have made those improvements. They're tested. So let's face it. The guys in Europe are decades ahead of us on grass. Yeah. Oh, most of like. And let, let's look at something else interesting. So, Silage inoculants in Europe and other countries are somewhat regulated by the government. You have to prove that the bull. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Prove something? You actually have to prove with third-party data that the microorganisms you're using and the CFU count you're using is actually providing the customer a benefit. If you, if from what I personally understand, in the U.S., they fall under the GRAS rule or generally regarded as safe. And so you're free to just kind of sell bugs in a jug. You and I could piss in a bathtub and call it for silage yeah. enough. You know, to yeah. be if, if that's the case, we're in business, brother. <laughs> <laughs> But from, that's my understanding after talking to a lot of inoculant guys. And yeah. so, like you said, they're a long ways ahead of us in putting up extremely wet forages because they don't get those drying conditions that we'll get. And, um, and I've done some in-house studies in our nursery. And um, that's another, I'll have to pull out that data, but that's from another discussion another day. You're saving protein, you're saving energy, you're not seeping, you're not, it's just so simple and it costs you know, pennies a ton kind of deal. And so I, um, I recommend getting with someone who knows their stuff on this, on, you know, whoever your local guy is and making sure it's done right. Yep. You're right. I think we can have a whole nother conversation. And, and if you need some recommendations, folks, don't be afraid to reach out to myself. I will get connected to the gentleman Let's see, on the screen, it's, it's hard for me to tell which way this is going to show up later, but that guy over there, yeah, we'll, we can make sure that you get some of the right information from the right people that have worked with those high moisture grasses and, um, yeah, yeah. I have plenty of contacts for that and get set up well versus taking a chance at something that there's a me too thing and not be quite as good. Cause that, yes, I don't want to, I don't want to downplay anybody, but it does happen yeah. where the information you, you think is pretty solid, but until you have touched it, felt it, done it, yeah. proven it, comfortable, confident, and some people that you work with, you just you just have that feel. So yeah, yeah. 
<sighs> well, great. Mr. Chris Leach, always thank you for your time you. today. Yeah, yeah, always good to chat, bro. If y'all got well, questions or anything, just reach out to me. Right on. Well, everybody, we're going to sign off here from the Forge Fanatic and Mr. Millet down there in the south. Have yourself a great day. Thanks again. Thanks. See ya. Bye.